only mode. Good afternoon and good morning to you if you are on the West Coast. My name is Jose Leon, Chief Medical Officer at the National Center for Health and Public Housing. I want to welcome and thank you all for attending today's webinar, Increasing Health Literacy in Dental Settings, Key Recommendation for Practice. This webinar is being recorded and all the information and resources, including the slides and other materials, will be emailed to you after the webinar has finished. At the end of the webinar, there will be a question and answer session. Please do not forget to respond to our post-webinar surveys. Your feedback is important to us. I would like to thank uh, HERSA for allowing us to make this webinar possible. The mission of the National Center for Health and Public Housing is to strengthen the capacity of federally funded public housing primary care health centers and other health center grantees by providing training and a range of technical assistance. A focus on health literacy is critical, especially since the US population is becoming increasingly uh, diverse. One common barrier to effective communication is health education materials that are not prepared at appropriate uh, literacy levels. For the target populations, adults with limited health uh, literacy report less knowledge about their medical condition and treatment, poorer health status, less understanding and use of preventive services, and a higher rate of hospitalization. For example, uh, some racial and ethnic populations may have limited English language proficiency because English is not their primary language. The uh, low health literacy is more uh, prevalent among uh, older adults, uh, minority populations, those who have low socioeconomic status, and medically underserved uh, populations. This is uh, extremely important for those health centers that are located in or immediately accessible to public housing. Uh, spe uh, specifically, those living in public housing uh, are uh, people with a special with a special needs. Uh, people um, who were homeless or people who have HIV AIDS or people returning from prisons. Also, we have uh, elderly and people with disabilities living in public housing. As you can see, 38% uh, of residents living in public housing are children and 16 to 17% of them are um, people over 65 years of age. The is very uh, worth not, uh, to noticing that 55% uh, of residents have less than a high school uh, diploma. So for patients with low health literacy, they may have uh, difficulties uh, pro uh, locating providers and services, filling out complex health forms, sharing their uh, medical history with providers, seeking preventive health care, knowing the connection between risk behaviors and health, managing chronic health conditions, and understanding directions on medicine. We are very pleased to have Sharif Clough uh, as a speaker. Sharif Clough is the uh, manager, preventive health activities for the Council on Advocacy for Access and Prevention at the American Dental Association. She is a dental hygienist and has a master in science in education in adult and higher education. Her role at the American, uh, I'm sorry, Dental Association is to manage population-based population preventive oral health activities, facilitate the work of CAP, National Advisory Committee on Health Literacy in Dentistry, and the Prevention Subcommittee, and provide technical assistance and information regarding preventive health activities to ADA members and consumers. I'm turning the presentation over to Sherry. Good afternoon, Sherry. Good afternoon, um, um, and thank you, Dr. Leon, for allowing me the opportunity to present this webinar on health literacy. Today, we are going to talk about what health literacy is and why it's important. It's so important. Tips for providing health literate information to patients and making your organization, clinic, and health literate organization, and discuss actions the ADA is taking to be a health literate health organization. Okay. 
According to the 2003 National Assessment of Adult Literacy Report, only 12% of adults have proficient health literacy skills. That means that nearly 9 out of 10 adults may lack the skills they need to manage their health and prevent disease. They may have difficulty understanding and using everyday health information that they encounter in healthcare facilities, retail outlets, media, and communities. And 14% of adults, which is about 30 million people, have below basic health literacy skills. Adults at the below basic level have only very elementary literacy skills. They may not be literate in English. They may have the ability to locate easily identifiable information that might be found in short paragraphs of text. An example would be the ability to circle the date of their next dental appointment found on a dental appointment slip. These adults are more likely to report their health is poor, about 42%, and are more likely to lack health insurance, about 28%, than adults with proficient health literacy skills. We know that if someone can't under, understand instructions, he or she is not going to be able to follow them. That person won't know the reason why he or she should do what, they, what she or he are instructed, and he may not understand the seriousness of the condition. Have you ever given a, a patient post-care instructions that they did not follow? Did you ever notice a blank look on your patient's face when explaining treatment that, that he or she needed? Did your patient have difficulty understanding the instructions for prescription that you gave him or her? Do you have a patient that lacks health care coverage because he didn't know how to navigate the health care system? These scenarios might have had more positive outcomes if the use of health literacy principles had been considered. So the question is, do we as clinicians take into account what we are saying and are we communicating or are we just saying words? Another consideration about um, health literacy is that limited health literacy is costly. In 2007, it cost the U.S. between $110 and $200 billion each year. Surgeons General and other federal agency leaders have much to say about the importance of health literacy. Dr. Richard Carmona, the former U.S. Surgeon General, talked about health literacy in more than 200 of his speeches, and he said um, such things as, um, as a former nurse, trauma surgeon, and public health director, I realized there was a wall between us and the people we were trying to serve. Um, healthcare professionals don't recognize that patients do not understand the health information we are trying to communicate, and we have to close the gap between what, what healthcare professionals know and what the rest of, of America understands. And so I checked out what, if there, there was statements by other surgeons general about health literacy, and there were. Um, Dr. Uh, Kenneth uh, Morris Sugo says the health literacy crosses all sectors of our society, and despite the level of education, race, age, and income, we, we need to be aware that um, these people might have low health literacy skills despite what their age, race, income, and education levels are. And the former acting Surgeon General, Regina um, M. Benjamin, stated that it is important that our patients understand that we tell them so that, tell, it's important that our, under, oh, sorry, that our patients understand what we tell them so they can make informed decisions about their health. Failure um, for them to understand um, it's the same as if we didn't treat them. And former uh, Surgeon General um, Dr. Murthy said that um, he encouraged us to provide the American people the best health information to provide the public the ability to make informed decisions about their health. And finally, um, uh, Sylvia Burwell, former Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, stated that if we want health equity, we need to make health literacy a priority. So what is health literacy? How would you define it? If I were standing physically in front of you giving this presentation, I would be asking your thoughts about what health literacy is. Unfortunately, in this venue, I can't do that. But while I go through the definition of health literacy, I ask you to think about what was the, what the term health literacy means to you. According to the Institute of Medicine uh, 2000 report, Health Literacy, a Prescription to End Confusion, 
the definition of health literacy is the degree to which individual has the capacity to obtain, communicate, process, and understand basic health information and services to make appropriate health decisions. So in other words, the health provider needs to provide information that the patient can understand and use. But on the other hand, patient needs to be able to understand the information they receive so that they can take action. So let's talk about the, um, what health, uh, health literacy skills that the dental provider needs. We need to help find people information and service, make a habit of knowing where your patients can find information. Be familiar with reliable internet sources that you can refer them to for additional information. And if they need additional health services, have that information for them ready for you to hand to them as they leave their appointment. We need to develop the skills needed to provide useful information and services and talk to patients about their health and health care in a way that they can understand. We need to really listen to what your patient is asking or say, saying so you can give them the appropriate answers, the answers they need, to an they need to answer their questions and address their needs. And the information and services the patient needs and can act on based on the specific needs of that specific patient. Anyone who needs health information and services also needs health literacy skills to interpret that information. So let's talk about health literacy skills for the patient. Patients require the ability to find the information and services they need. They need to be able to communicate their needs and respond to the information and services that they receive. And they need to be able to process the meaning of the information and determine the usefulness of what they learn or the services they receive. So what's your role as a provider in health literacy? Let's talk about that. What do we learn from patients? From interviewing hundreds of patients and performing many focus groups, experts have found that patients have some good ideas for us. They want us to tell them what's wrong, but they want, to keep it, they want us to keep it brief and then tell them what they need to do and why and to emphasize the benefits for the patient. For example, if we're talking about taking medication, we should break it down into smaller chunks of information. A conversation about medication could include, what is the medication? Exactly how do I take this medication? What is the benefit for me if I take this medicine? And finally, what can I expect in terms of side effects and benefits? And remember, what's clear to you is just clear to you, so you need to really make an effort, put in an effort to provide information in a way that's clear to the patient. So that we don't give too much information, remember to keep it simple. We can focus on just what the patient needs to know and needs to do. Give them concretes to follow. We can use the teach back method to confirm understanding, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. And we can use pictures or demonstrate techniques. Don't just talk about it, that's confusing for patients. The saying, a picture is worth a thousand words, is very true. And always use clearly written education materials that we know the patient can understand. Let's look at the need to know and need to do. It's, a, it's helpful to think about what the patient needs when they leave the exam room, when they check out, and what they need to do when they get home. You can ask, how do, you, how, how do um, they take their medicines, if any are prescribed? What self-care strategies can they use? What about any referrals or follow-up items? What forms do they need to fill out? So if you keep that outline in your, in, you know, in your head and think about what they're going to need before they leave the office, um, you're going to be providing them the information that they're going to need and be able to use. Using teach back is a great way to explain um, to patients the self-managed process. On this slide, you'll see the schematic of the teach back method. The idea is to explain the self-management process, for example, post-op instructions for an extraction, then assess a person's knowledge by asking them to teach it back to the clinician, 
And then the clinician, or you can clarify if the patient does not quite have it right. Um, this cycle can be repeated until there is a shared understanding. So you can see where the arrows are that there is sort of double backing from between access and clarifying. And that's just because as you ask that patient um, what they're understanding, you can go back and, and clarify items that they're not understanding. And finally, hopefully, the end result is that uh, they do understand the information you're giving them. The teach-back strategy is a way to ensure agreement and understanding about the care plan and is essential to achieving adherence. Uh, you can ask the patient something like, I want to make sure I explained it correctly. Can you tell me in your own words how you understand the plan we have made for you to take care of that extraction site? But when you are confirming patient understanding, um, try to avoid questions such as, do you understand or do you have um, any questions, closed-ended questions that only require one-word one answers. These type of questions end up in a one-word answer, and usually the answer is no. Instead, we, the, you, you should say something like, tell me what you've understood about flossing your teeth. Or I want to make sure that I've explained clearly how to floss, I've explained clearly to you how to floss your teeth. Can you tell me how you do that? By doing that, you are actually, you know, ensuring that the patient understands what you said. Okay, so now that you know a little about teach back, let's talk about written materials you might give a patient. It's important to know that when written materials are used alone, they will not adequately inform the patient. Um, patients prefer receiving key messages from their dental provider with accompanying pamphlets. Better to think of a pamphlet as a facilitator of a conversation rather than a replacement of a conversation. Uh, so don't, you know, and we tend to do that because we're busy, so as patients walking out, you say, well, here's a, here's a pamphlet on um, how to floss. Take a look at it and, and give it a try. And that's, that's not going to be as effective as sitting and talking to your patient about um, how to floss and then handing them out the pamphlet so they have something to refer to when they're at home. When we design our messages for patients, we should focus on the need to know and the need to do. And again, keep it simple. Oftentimes, those of us in the um, dental uh, field give a lot of extra unneeded information, and um, what patients generally want to know is what they need to know and what they need to do. Keep in mind that with low literacy, um, people with low literacy tend to ask fewer questions, so it's important for us as dental staff to help patients identify what they need to hear again and to assess what they understand. So, you know, watch for the um, cues, um, body language, confused look, um, so that and if you feel like they're not understanding, go back and explain again. It never hurts to repeat. And finally, it can be very helpful to have a patient bring a family member or friend um, along on the appointment. Having a family member present, present helps ensure that questions get asked and helps the patient remember what was discussed. Using pictures uh, can help patients remember more. Uh, people with low literacy and visual learner, learners tend to rely more on pictures. So instead of um, drawing or using a complex drawing or diagram, patients find it very helpful to have hand-drawn sketches. It's just easier for them to understand. And um, you can actually, if you're sitting there drawing the picture, you can pretty much draw what you feel that the patient needs to know. And as dental providers, we know that when it comes to providing instructions on self-care, such as brushing and flossing, um, it's important to demonstrate the technique to the patient rather than um, just talking about it. Uh, when asked for feedback, patients will say, show me and I can do it. And so we should take that, that um, instruction very seriously, that we need to show the patients what we want them to do and um, chances are they will be able to do it. So let's go through some tips for um, clinicians using health literacy skills. Um, number one, use plain language. Uh, think about how you would explain things to someone who has no dental background, such as the cashier at the grocery store. We tend to, you know, we're so engrossed what we do and we're, we, you know, technical terms are so, um, 
ingrained in us that a lot of times we don't realize that we are talking in technical terms. So, terms. so be very aware of what you're saying and really try to make it as simple as possible. Uh, limit your key points to more, no more than three to five key points. We don't want to overload the patients. Think about what you want the patient to remember and then focus on those key points. Um, in this case, um, in this instance, more is definitely not better. Be specific and concrete, not general. Um, if action is involved, go through every detail, um, you know, so that they, they're, they're going to see everything step by step. Uh, again, demonstrate actions like the flush that actually demonstrate how um, they can, how they should floss. Um, draw pictures and use models. Um, and then, you know, at that point, have the patient demonstrate back to you what you've just shown them. Repeat and summarize the information. Um, again, repeating is never a bad thing. It gives the um, patient time to process the information. And uh, many times, we just need to hear things more than once before it really sinks in. Use the teach back method to confirm understanding and to help patients move the information into their long-term memory. And always be positive, hopeful, empowering. Um, you want to make the patient, um, you want to empower them. You want them to know that when they leave that, when they leave your office, they're going to be able to do what you ask them to do. So let's talk a little bit about um, using plain language. Um, plain language is communication where your audience can understand understand what you said the first time they or what understand what they read or heard for the first time. There are key elements in developing a plain language document. Um, you want to organize your information so that the most important points points come first and break up the complex information into understandable chunks. So if you're writing a document, those chunks should actually, there should actually be white space between those um, informational points so that it's easy for um, the reader to find that information. And it, it's not overwhelming when they're reading it. Um, always use simple language um, in defining technical terms and use the active voice. Keep in mind that the information um, might be, that might be clear for one person may not necessarily be um, as plain to others. So, you know, um, think about who your audience is or, you know, who your patient is and develop the appropriate um, information. And the best way to be sure that you're providing information that our audience understands is have them test your materials. So if you're in the process of developing some patient educational materials, you know, have your patients, give them the opportunity to look at the materials and see if they can understand what the information is that you are providing. And do that in the process, um, during the process that you're developing those, those documents and after they're developed. Um, do a patient survey and see if they're understanding the information that you're providing them. And on the screen, you'll see a list of um, words that we use routinely that are not considered um, plain language. So, you know, in your spare time, I know that you're going to be getting this um, web I'm sorry, this um, presentation, this PowerPoint presentation. So take a look at the list of words and see if, that you, if you can come up with the words that are uh, more clear, more understandable. So here's some, um, an exa some examples of words that you know, are more technical and words that can replace those um, more technical terms. So if we want to say, come in on an annual basis. We could say come in once a year or every year. If we're talking about gingivitis, uh, we're talking about infected gums would be more, you know, understandable to the patient. Cardiovascular de disease having to do with um, heart um, disease or heart problems. If we're talking about diabetes, you have elevated sugar in the blood. An amalgam could be a silver filling. And periodontist, you know, a dentist who treats gum disease. Um, but also remember that when you're using plain language, you don't necessarily have to not use the technical term. You just need to explain it. So um, you can say you have gingiv gingivitis, which is an infection of the gums, or I'm going to put an amalgam into, you know, uh, repair the tooth, and that is the silver filling. So that you're sort of educating the patient on some terms too. Oops. 
So thus far we've talked about what health literacy is and developing skills to address health literacy, such as the use of teach back and the use of plain language. However, as we um, reflect on, as we reflect on how we provide care, let's consider what impression we give our patients when they come to the office, to the clinic. Are we, are we actually providing patient-centered care? Is there a, a welcoming, calm environment? Um, do we see an attitude of healthfulness from all the staff, um, including patient-friendly appointment scheduling? Um, you know, is your patient overwhelmed? They might be, you know, uh, somewhat uh, worried about being in their office. Is everyone paying attention to that patient and making sure that they're the important person right then and there? Do you have um, um, patient-friendly check-in procedures and easy-to-follow instructions for referrals and tests? Are patients... Um, upset because they're waiting to be called in or, you know, is, it, is there a line at the, the front desk where, when they're waiting to check in? Um, have we incorporated patient-centered handouts? Are we following up with our patients over the phone? Do we provide any type of case management for patients who need extra help? You know, all these things are, you know, it's helping the patient and making them feel important, and that's what you want to do. We want to make sure that patients know they're important and the, that the, actually the staff is there to help them. They're, they are the, you know, their they're go-to people. So what is the ADA doing about health literacy and dentistry? The ADA's Council on Advocacy for Access and Prevention, which is the council that I'm from, facilitates the work of the National Advisory Committee on Health Literacy and Dentistry. The committee consists of experts in the field of health literacy from, coming from dentistry, medicine, education, research, and communications. They have been very instrumental in helping the ADA become a health literate health organization. And the photo you see is actually the um, picture of our what we call NACLED um, members as of 2017-2018. One of the, the uh, duties or operations of NF NACLED is to recommend policies and actions that the ADA can pursue. And the ADA has several policies on the topic of health literacy from providing a definition of oral health literacy, which you see here, which you, if you read it, it's pretty much the same as the um, health literacy uh, definition that I read at the beginning of this presentation, but it, it ends with making appropriate oral health decisions instead of health decisions. We also state that limited oral health literacy is a potential barrier to effective prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of oral disease. And an important one is that um, we, we resolve that um, we, or we emphasize the importance of using health literacy principles in plain language for all patients and not just for those we assume may have low health literacy skills. Every person that walks in your office, you should be using um, good um, health literacy principles and, and communication skills. Because even if you have uh, somebody that has a PhD that comes in, they may have low health literacy skills about dentistry. So we have to take that all into account when we talk to our patients. And another um, action that the um, uh, NACLT has done is actually they uh, have developed an um, action plan for the ADA for health literacy and dentistry. Um, this is actually the second one. The first one was uh, uh, 2010 to 2015. Uh, we are now on the 2016 to 2020 health action plan, and, and very soon we'll be updating that for the uh, 2021 to 2026 action plan. So the action plan actually has five strategic focus areas for the improvement of health literacy, including um, training education, advocacy, research, dental practice, and building and maintaining coalitions. And all of these um, five actions are actually articulated in the 2003 National Call to Action to Promote Oral Health. And so that some of the actions, I sort of made a 
little flow chart here, but some of the actions that are included are under becoming a health literate, uh, um, health, literate health organization. Uh, we're informing and educating ADA staff and leadership about health literacy. You know, we have to, health literacy in an organization has to come from the top down and also from the bottom up. So um, we have done training for our leadership and for staff. They're encouraged to take um, classes on health literacy. Uh, we provide consumers, or we're trying to provide consumers understandable messaging um, and user-friendly contacts. We, we collaborate with other stakeholders and we explore research and policy making opportunities. As far as educating um, practitioners, we host um, or sponsor an annual CE, CE course on health literacy at the ADA's annual meeting. And we also have plans to develop a, a video um, for providers on health literacy and a, a toolkit that would go along with that. And we're focusing on dental school education. Um, the ADA, with the help of NACO, um, will implement a, a survey to assess the health literacy skills of dental school students so we know their needs to provide uh, appropriate resources for them. It's important that students learn early on about health literacy and we're trying to take steps to make sure that um, not only dental students but all um, uh, dental auxiliary, dental hygiene students have information about health literacy in their dental and dental hygiene education. Um, as far as producing health literate patient education materials, a key to AD staff are being trained on writing health literate and plain language information. We actually have an internal action plan to direct next steps in providing easily understood information to consumers. So we want to make sure that those patient education um, pamphlets that were, you know, that we develop are easily read and understood and also any information that's on our, our website is easily under, understood, understandable. And as a part of the plan that I just mentioned, um, specific patient education materials are going to actually be reviewed by um, an outside agency that will employ focus groups to determine readability and ease of use. So that's a big um, move for the ADA to start assessing these materials for health literacy. So the information I have provided during this webinar is just the, like the tip of the iceberg of information that's available for you to learn um, more about health literacy. And so to provide, we, and we realize that, that there's a lot of information to learn. So to provide resources for dental professionals, um, the ADA has a health literacy and dentistry webpage. And the webpage can, um, provides information, hyperlinks to, um, resources about increasing the dental team's knowledge about health literacy, um, improving the health literacy environment of the dental office, and also consumer education. So we actually have a hyperlink to other organizations' um, resources that can be given to patients about oral health. We have our mouthhealthy.org um, website that's um, ADA's consumer website. and um, one of the features on the website are slideshows on various topics. Uh, this one lists nine foods that are bad for your teeth uh, and includes info on candy, soda, and sport drinks. Um, there's all types of information. This one would be found under nutrition, but there's um, numerous um, topic areas and also the information is provided by age. So there's for you know baby, uh, baby toddlers, um, adolescents, and then adults. So, uh, any, almost anything a, a, a consumer, a patient would want to know about health, I mean, I'm sorry, about oral health, they can find on mouthhealthy.org and it's, it's pretty, it's, it's user friendly, it's, um, it's attractive, it, it can certainly catch um, users' attention. And our ADA communi communication staff are working hard to provide information to consumers that's easy to understand. So that is also going through some um, review to make sure that that information is in plain language um, and easily readable. So in addition, and I, I have another uh, slide here, it shows um, six ways to reduce your child's sugar snacking. That's more in, in written text rather than a slideshow, but they also are um, uh, highlighting uh, 
holidays. So like for Halloween, there's information about, you know, your oral health, how to eat healthy during Halloween or even like Christmas and Thanksgiving. Christmas, we actually have um, Hermes the Elf that talks about oral health. And so I mentioned previously that um, we want to make sure that students have an opportunity to learn and experience um, health literacy. So one way we're doing that is through a health literacy essay contest for dental students. And it's sponsored by the ADA. It was actually recommended to us or uh, we were asked to sponsor an a, a essay contest for dental students uh, through Case Western Reserve uh, University dental school faculty member, Dr. Soren Tyke asked us to run a um, contest. So um, it started in 2015 as a pilot program. That year, the, the uh, Case Western Reserve was the only participating school in the contest. Uh, two years later, we now have 17 schools participating in the contest. And dental students from these participating schools submit essays on a specific topic. And for this one, this was the first year, the topic was, um, was on diabetes and oral health. Since then, last year we had it on sugar sweetened beverages, and this year's contest uh, was on um, important things to know about baby teeth. Uh, the competition not only you know, uh, challenges students to provide health liter literate information, but it also encourages them to use evidence-based research and health literacy principles. And the winning essay is also posted on ADA's, ADA's mouthhealthy.org website. On mouthhealthy.org, there's also um, information from the Ad Council campaign, which the ADA was part of uh, that campaign. Um, there's not much going on with that right now, but um, the videos that were used for um, public service announcements are posted on mouthhealthy.org. And they're, they're fun videos. If you have a chance to look at them, they're, they're fun videos. We also have our children's, uh, National Children's Dental Health Month uh, campaign that will be ending as of tomorrow. What's up on your screen are posters um, from the last three years. Poster on the very right is the 2018 um, post National, Children, National Children's Dental Health poster. It was actually designed by the, uh, an illustrative design student from Columbia College, Chicago. We sponsored a poster design contest with the school. Uh, we, we had the job of um, choosing a winner from um, 17 well-done, unique, and original submitted designs. So that was sort of a fun thing, way to um, get a, a poster design for this year. And last but not least, we have our patient education materials um, that are available through our ADA's Catalog Services Department. And I want to thank the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality um, for use of their Health Literacy Universal Precautions Toolkit. Um, I'm a firm believer of not having to, to create the, recreate the wheel. So some of the, the slides were um, from their toolkit. And I would highly suggest that uh, you check that, um, that website because they have a lot of good information about health literacy, and the toolkit is really a, a, good, um, a good tool to use if you're interested in um, incorporating more health literacy um, items into, your, into your, your practice. And that, that actually, that website can be found on the ADA's Health Literacy and Dentistry website. So I'm hoping that, um, that after you uh, listening to this webinar that I've helped you understand the importance of using health literacy skills to communicate with your patients. Uh, I've made you aware of the teach back strategies to help confirm patient understanding and give you the impetus to um, learn more about that technique, um, explain what plain language is and, and help you provide information that patients uh, can understand. I hope I've made you aware of the actions that the ADA has taken to be a health literate health organizations and of the resources that are available for dental providers about health literacy and also um, information that's uh, provided for consumers that printed in online easy to understand information about oral health. So please feel free, this is my uh, contact information that you will have with the um, PowerPoint, so please feel free to contact me if you have any additional questions.
Thanks, Sherry, for this uh, wonderful presentation. And thank you uh, to the American Dental Association uh, of all the resources that you provided uh, this uh, afternoon. Um, we are going to start our Q&A session. If you have a question to ask, uh, please submit it through the question box on your control panel. Or if you are dialed in through your phone, I would like to verbally ask uh, Cherie a question. Use the raise hand icon on your control panel and your line will be unmuted. And while we wait for uh, some questions, I would like to remind uh, all participants to please uh, complete the post survey and uh, your information and your feedback is very important. Thank you so much. So let's give some time to see if we get some questions. Okay, Sherry, uh, there is a question on from the uh, from one of the participants that uh, do you know any agency or organizations that provide health literacy training for dental settings? Um, actually, the CDC has two modules, online modules that you could um, use as a start. Um, I know that there are. Um, let me think. I know that there are agencies that provide like in-person training. They, they'll they'll come and do. And I have. To, I think it was through the Institute of Healthcare Advancement. I'm not sure if that's if they're doing that right now. Um, there might be local health literacy. Uh, organizations in their area. I know that we have one in Chicago that will actually come to your office and provide training. So um, it might be, you know, if you want something local, it might be wise to check to see if there's any health literacy um, organizations in, in your area. But on the online training that CDC offers is very good. One is on health literacy uh, principles and the other one is on um, using plain language. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, there is another question in the queue. Uh, what are the most frequent issues or misunderstandings for patients in dentistry when it comes to health literacy? Can you say that again? Sure. What are the most frequent issues or misunderstandings uh, among patients in uh, clinical settings or dental settings? I am assuming I that probably, the, I, I don't know if I understand the question, but I think probably the biggest thing would be misunderstanding, well, misunderstanding, but then not the patient not um, asking for clarification. So it sort of puts the onus on the provider and, again, using TeachBack to um, make sure that, you know, to confirm that there's understanding. Is okay. that... Yeah, and, uh, I'm not sure if the question is, it probably is about uh, any of the conditions and how to deal with the conditions. I believe that's, that's how the question has been uh, asked. Con Sp specifically, uh, what patients do not understand, I guess, when you, when, sure. when, you ha when you have contact with them and you are explaining to them. That's how I understand this question. Uh, let, let's wait to see if uh, the person who sent this question can clarify the question. Okay. 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 Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, I believe that you addressed this question. Uh, the next question is whether uh, American Dental Association have uh, materials in other languages and materials for children. Um, I actually, as far as I know, we have link, um, we have materials um, in Spanish. I don't know that we have any other languages. Okay. Yeah, and it's only, um, it depends on the topic for the patient 
at, for the, and if someone's interested in patient education uh, pamphlets, it depends on the topic. Okay, uh, let's see if there is any other questions in the queue. Let me just double check. Yes, there is another question here. Let me see. Just let me see if I can uh, make this bigger. It's having it. Okay. Here it is. How would you suggest uh, we approach the senior community when it comes to how important it is to having health teeth? I am a, I'm having difficulties in getting our senior community to understand that regardless of age, a health smile is health for the body. I hope I explained clearly. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> that's, that's a hard one. Um, um, I think one way would be is just to um, really emphasize the importance of oral health for over, overall health and how many um, diseases are, you know, linked to um, bad oral health. Um, that might be one way to um, motivate um, senior community for wanting good oral health. And then also, you know, just, you know, what our teeth do for us, you know, for eating, smiling, looks, um, and I, I think you might have already tried that. I, I guess that's sort of, you know, uh, it's, it's almost a cultural um, issue. So um, I think that's probably the best I could do and just be very, very um, consistent about providing information. All right. And um, she's uh, thanking you. Uh, well, can I go? Let me go back one more time. One more thing, though. You know, we talked about um, chunking the information, giving the information in in small chunks. So maybe instead of just you know um, talking about every reason why oral health is important, really, really focus on one item or you know two or even three items that seem to be really important for that patient. Their own unique individual needs. Okay, okay, and I believe that Sanja got that information. She's thanking you for, for the response. Okay. So thank you so much. I don't see any additional questions in the queue, and so uh, I'd like to thank one more time Cherie for her time, her expertise, and all the resources that she has provided to us this afternoon. Uh, this webinar has been recorded. Uh, if you would like to get more information about uh, the webinar, and the monographs and the training manuals that we have, uh, please visit our website, nchph.org. Uh, you can also join our mailing list and receive uh, her updates, Medicare updates, uh, information on funding opportunities, information about senior programs, resources and services, and upcoming webinars. You can also follow us on social media, follow us on Twitter, and you can also subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel. If you have any additional questions, you can contact any of our uh, 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 folks here, uh, the director of health, you can contact me. They are manager, uh, our manager of policy and research or, or anybody here. Uh, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact us. One more time, I would like to thank uh, Cherie. Thank you so much and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.